Welcome to the Wisconsin Office of Outdoor Recreation mini webinar series. Today's topic is leveraging the Great American Outdoors Act and the Land and Water Conservation Fund with guests from the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, the U.S. Forest Service Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest, and the Society of Outdoor Recreation Professionals. Outdoor recreation is a top reason for visiting Wisconsin due to Wisconsin's natural assets. Nearly half of Wisconsin is covered by forests, 15,000 inland lakes, 43,000 miles of river and shoreline, and 6 million acres of public land, including 49 state parks. Outdoor recreation contributes $7.8 billion to Wisconsin's gross domestic product. It's a real economic driver that supports 93,000 jobs, $3.9 billion in worker compensation, and home to world-class outdoor brands. The Office of Outdoor Recreation was established in 2019 with bipartisan support and in recognition of Wisconsin's plentiful outdoor recreation offerings and their economic value. The vision of the office is for Wisconsin to be recognized as a top outdoor recreation state for visitors, residents, and businesses. And the mission is to support and uplift the outdoor recreation industry and its partners for the economic health and overall well being of the state and its residents. We do this by aligning our partners around the four tenants to invite residents, visitors, businesses, and workforce talent to live, work, and play in Wisconsin, to experience the state's natural places and vast outdoor recreation offerings connect people to Wisconsin's natural places and outdoor recreation opportunities through access and education with a focus on inclusion. We believe people thrive when active lifestyles and outdoor recreation are promoted as ways to create healthy individuals and communities and sustain Wisconsin's invaluable natural assets by encouraging outdoor recreation, the connection to place and the preservation of healthy lands and waters. Today's topic is leveraging the Great American Outdoors Act and the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Pleased to be joined today by Jessica Wall Turner, the Executive Director of the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, Hillary Markin, the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center Director for the U.S. Forest Service, Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest, and Laurel Harkness, the Executive Director of the Society of Outdoor Recreation Professionals. I'm Mary Monroe Brown, the Director of the Office of Outdoor Recreation. It's my honor to kick off the webinar by introducing you to Jessica Wall Turner. Jessica? Great, thank you, Mary, and thanks so much uh, for having me here. This is a great idea. I love the mini series and uh, pleased to be joining you. I'm Jessica Wall Turner, the Executive Director of the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. I've spent about 10 years in the outdoor recreation space in the public sector with the Department of the Interior, um, private and NGO sectors at Outdoor Industry Association before this, and um, have always noticed the need for broader coalitions, exactly what you're building in the state and what, you know, ORR has hoped to build nationally. And so uh, next slide. We are a coalition of 32 outdoor recreation associations serving over 110,000 outdoor businesses in every corner of the country and really representing the full breadth of outdoor recreation activities. So our goal is to work together to make the recreation pie bigger instead of fighting over the slices of the pie. So we want more people to get out and do the things that drive local communities, local economies, jobs, and quality of life. And speaking of local economies, next slide, we have come together for the first time to get our industry uh, pointed as a unique sector of uh, the economy. And so we have this great data coming out of the federal government now so we can compare apples to apples with other industries. I'm sure you've seen these numbers before and there's great numbers for the state of Wisconsin as well, but we're a $778 billion industry employing 5.2 million Americans. And what's really interesting is while we're 2.2% of the GDP, which is you know, really hard to comprehend. We're also growing faster than the economy as a whole in every indicator. So when you're looking at economic drivers 
things to track and follow. Uh, outdoor recreation is certainly one of them and certainly bigger than a lot of industries that, you know, we think of as, as really um, helping support communities and economies like agriculture and mining and utilities. Next slide. So with this data, we were actually um, able to show up in such a unique and powerful way this year to help move one of the most successful recreation and conservation policies uh, in the past five decades, or I would argue uh, ever, uh, the Great American Outdoors Act. So um, this was pretty record breaking and how fast it was passed four months since introduction. So if you think about how slow policy change um, takes and how much time, you know, Congress debates issues, you know, for years and years, um, this bill was introduced in March right before the pandemic started sweeping the country and was passed in July. So that's a really telling of um, all the things that had to come together to make this bill pass. Um, Felt like an unachie unachievable goal, certainly, uh, as April and May shutdowns started to happen and Congress was focused on many other different things. And it's also, you know, one of the most politically uh, divided times in our nation's history. So uh, the outdoor recreation community was able to come together. And I'm going to walk through some of the ways that we were able to help pass this bill and then talk uh, for a couple minutes about what this means for outdoor recreation in Wisconsin and across the country. So first of all, education on things like land and water conservation fund and the maintenance backlog, we've been teeing up those conversations for a long time talking about access. LWCF is probably nomenclature for a lot of people in this world and now even the user community. We were always able to tie this back to recreation jobs and numbers and with the looming health crisis and what was going on, we were able to make a direct uh, connection with people and access and health in the outdoors and what you were seen on TV every day. Uh, so saying that, you know, this isn't just a bill that needs to happen. This is a bill that needs to happen now. People need these places to be outside and local economies need these places uh, to help drive their uh, communities uh, and jobs, certainly employment. So we, we connected it to what was happening in the country at the time. We also made the pie bigger. You know, National Park Service used to be the only agency in this bill, and it was really important to the recreation community to bring in the Bureau of Land Management uh, the U.S. Forest Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and Fish and Wildlife Service, where a lot of recreation takes place. Parks are um, wonderful and beautiful places, and, and I know we all have our favorite national park, um, but a lot of the recreation day-to-day -day does happen uh, on our Forest Service lands or our Fish and Wildlife Service lands. And so when we brought in those agencies to the bill, we were able to make, again, that pie bigger, bring in more recreation community members, bring in more members of Congress that had those lands in their backyards and maybe not a national park. We also showcased the depth and the breadth of the industry by working together. We highlighted these shared values um, that the entire recreation community had in common, but also the conservation community and, and our state partners. So we showed that this was a win-win. Uh, there wasn't a downside from this community. These were things that everyone wanted, no matter if you were a backpacker or a snowmobiler, you know, an angler or a hunter, this was important for you. Uh, we also did grass tops calls, obviously, with CEOs calling members, grassroots calls, uh, and emails and organize kind of the strategic engagement on the back end. Um, so what members saw and Congress saw and the administration saw with thousands of people talking about this every day, uh, but making sure that the right voices were being heard at the right time. So, you know, in Wisconsin, it might have been the motorcycle industry or the hunting and fishing industry uh, that would show up. Certainly in Missouri, it was Cabela's and in Georgia, it was Yamaha and in Colorado, it was the North Face. So making sure that there were these authentic messengers in the state um, and we were using different businesses and different entities at different times. Uh, we have a couple pictures here of um, Senator and Congressman who introduced the bill actually talking about our outdoor recreation business letter with 130 of the biggest cross-sector businesses from all over the country and all over the industry uh, using that letter to persuade their colleagues to vote yes and a lot of that worked. Um, we made the case in this letter and in much of our outreach to Congress that uh, this wasn't just a nice to have, this was a need to have, tying it to pandemic relief for businesses, tying it to unemployment, and tying it to um, the quality of life and American spirit that really drives us. So uh, next slide. What this looks like for recreation 
now is a lot of money, um, probably the most uh, funding we've ever had um, at a single time in history for recreation and conservation. So that's a fully funded land and water conservation fund at $900 million a year. And when you think about that, we've only been funded at about $450 million a year over 50 years. So we're basically doubling the opportunity for land and water conservation projects. Similarly, we're looking at um, a huge investment, almost $2 billion a year across the federal agencies in our backlog work. And so many organizations are kind of patting themselves on the back and thanking their champions and saying, we did this and this is awesome, let's move on. Uh, ORR in the business community sees the work as really just beginning. Um, this is opening up opportunities across the country in every county. And one of the things we're hyper-focused on is rural development and how we can use LWCF specifically to grow main street economies, how we can use um, how we can use the maintenance backlog uh, and infrastructure, better infrastructure to recruit and retain not just outdoor recreation businesses, but um, the next Goldman Sachs, the next uh, tech startup, the next healthcare company who wants to be near wonderful recreation assets. Um, the second big piece is really how we can drive equity and inclusion around access. Uh, one of the things that was so interesting as this conversation was happening in the spring um, were the governors coming on the air and saying, you know, don't leave your local community, don't go out there and travel, um, stay close to home, and in the same breath, get outside, you know, get vitamin D, get exercise, the virus doesn't spread as much uh, when you're outdoors. And those were really competing interests in a lot of communities. Uh, they were looking outside and saying, I don't have a bike path, I don't have a fishing hole, I don't have boating access, um, I don't even have a park within 10 minutes of my home. And so using the Land and Water Conservation Fund, especially the state and local side of the program, to open up access where it doesn't exist um, and to maintain the access of those sites for communities that haven't had um, these great green spaces uh, before. So we are hyper uh, interested in matching dollars and using the business community uh, to help support the stateside portion of the program to help support good ideas. And the next slide shows how we're collaborating with state and federal agencies. Um, our work right now has been focused on the implementation. So we've been working with uh, USDA and their rural development team really to think about the land and water conservation project in a different way. Um, we've got some great examples about how we can frame up LWCF projects that are directly linked with local community economic goals. And we're also working with the Department of the Interior Great Outdoors Act implementation and coordination team to ensure that they have the best information as well from the recreation community to move forward. We are collecting for the first time recreation projects. If you think about the recreation community's work on these bills, it's really been about funding and reauthorization. We've never thought about what does that look like on the ground because we've spent so much time working with Congress just to get you know, the funding, the adequate funding that we need. So now that we have that, we're thinking really strategically about projects that meet recreation goals. We're looking to the states for ideas on these projects. And I think it's important that the states understand there's now a guaranteed minimum of $360 million a year going to the states and that can go up to $540 million a year. So um, the pot is so much bigger, the opportunity is so much broader, and we want to be partners in coming up with um, the best projects that meet the needs of the states and certainly the needs of the recreation uh, user community and business community. We've developed white papers that outline our goals. We have a mapping um, assessment, actually, of the maintenance backlog. And I'll leave with this one um, really interesting data point when you dig into the millions and billions of dollars of backlog and all the data that we've been digging into, um, you find that with the right uh, concentration on return on investment, um, with the right applications and the right leadership at the agencies, uh, they can solve for the entire recreation backlog in these next five years. Um, they you know, will need to utilize youth cores um, to make sure they're getting young people engaged and the costs are staying down. They'll need to think about recreation sites holistically. So we're not just fixing a road that ends at a campground that's defunct. We're fixing a whole recreation experience. And they'll need to think about public-private partnerships and how to bring in private investment in areas that they know uh, they're going to fund through this pot of money to make, again, these 
these places, not just up to today's standards, but modernized for tomorrow standards and for the next 10 years of standards. Um, so we're really excited to hold the agencies accountable for thinking differently and using this money wisely and even more excited about what the successes might look like in five years to get this bill reauthorized um, for the maintenance backlog and to work on LWCF with uh, Mary and her team and, and all the state offices uh, and governors on LWCF funding in perpetuity. So we, we have this great opportunity and I just uh, really look forward to seizing it with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jess. That was fantastic, full of uh, just a ton of information. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I'd like to now introduce to you Hillary Markin, who's the Public Affairs Office and Director of the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center for the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest. Thanks, Hillary, for joining us. Great. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you for the invitation today to share some information about the Great America's Outdoors Act and in particular how that's affecting folks in Wisconsin and the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest. My name is Hillary Markin and I'm the director of the David R. Obi Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center in Ashland, Wisconsin on the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest. Um, jump in here to the Great America's Outdoor Act. So the Forest Service was very pleased to hear the passage of the Act in August, um, which enables you know, us to take aggressive steps to address deferred maintenance and other infrastructure projects on national forests and grasslands across the country. The Forest plans to use these funds to maximize the benefits experienced by millions of Americans who visit and use their national forests and rangelands. Projects funded will focus on reducing deferred maintenance, improving the conditions and resiliency of our national forests for present and future generations. The act is established for five years, starting in fiscal year 21, which just started at the beginning of this month, and going until fiscal year 25. The maximum amount the Forest Service will receive is 285 million each year during the five years that the fund is authorized. For a little perspective on that, the Eastern Region, which includes 17 national forests and one national tallgrass prairie, has 504 million in deferred maintenance, which includes facilities, dams, trails, roads, campgrounds, and utility systems. And the Eastern Region is just one region of nine across the entire country. The Great Americans Outdoors Act is one important step in restoring what our visitors love about national forests and in particular the eastern region where the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest is. Improvements to these visitor facilities, campgrounds and trails are essential to us to continue to provide that world-class experience to our visiting public. We recognize that there's a lot of excitement and acknowledge the difficulty in how we're going to choose these projects as which ones are our top priorities. We also understand that not all local projects will be funded, but we also want to hear about those. Even if it's not like going to be funded by the Greatest America's Outdoor Act, potentially, we have many other opportunities, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Our focus is on important upgrades that are ready to implement immediately, will improve those conditions, enhance visitor experience, and increase access to communities and recreation sites on the Schwamigan Nicolay and across the entire Forest Service. Due to the immediate demand for project lists shortly after the passage of law, which happened in August, the first year project proposal list was built using projects that already had strong public support um, from various other public engagement efforts, including letters or messages that we had gotten from the public or other meetings and engagements from partners and stakeholders, much like what we are doing today, kind of sharing information and then looking forward to future engagements on what folks feel is important um, to see on their national forest. This act provides an opportunity to leverage resources, knowledge, and expertise from our partners. And we are really excited about the opportunity to engage with all of you and make a difference on the ground and in our communities. Project proposals for FY21 had this in mind. The Forest Service invited the public in early September to provide feedback on the deferred maintenance projects under consideration to be prioritized for this fiscal year's funding. Due to the short turn turnaround, feedback was solicited through a virtual sensing platform. A response to the feedback submitted during this opportunity um, will not be provided, but is definitely being taken into consideration. 
Projects selected will um, also need to be compliant with the National Environmental Policy Act, one of those standard things for anything that happens on our lands. The next few slides, including this one, show the different projects that were out there in that virtual platform um, and wanted to just showcase them. You also notice that the pictures in this presentation also are showcasing some of the beautiful areas in the Schwamigan Nicolay that are part of our project um, proposals list. And our project list is also available on our website. There's the link there and you're more than welcome to go and look. It's got all of them for the Eastern region listed them. And there is a short description that better articulates what um, that project would do at that particular um, recreation site. What are the next steps? So the list of deferred maintenance um, and the act specifies that that list will be submitted to the president to by the president to Congress. The Congress then will approve the list as part of the established appropriations process. Once the annual budget is approved, the Forest Service will implement the priority projects approved by Congress. We will share more information about approved projects when the final list is available in the president's annual budget request. The Forest Service very much appreciates all the hard work that the administration and Congress has done to help us begin to address our deferred maintenance backlog through this important legislation. Moving ahead, you know, through our partner collaborations, the Forest Service hopes to learn more about where the public sees the greatest need and how we can better serve them. The opportunities to create lasting investments and put people to work in communities across the nation are vast, and these deferred maintenance and related infrastructure problems, infrastructure projects will help us improve access to the places that you guys all feel are important. You don't have to wait though, I mentioned this earlier, for specific feedback or comment forums to engage with us. In addition to the Great America's Outdoors Act, um, the Forest Service has many other tools that we can work with to accomplish work on the national forest and even sometimes adjacent to our forest. So our door is always open. Um, we would love to hear from you. If you have project ideas, um, you know, things that are important to you, the communities where you live and work, you know, we'd love to hear from you. And, you know, it just takes that phone call to reach out to us and start that, that process of talking. And a lot of times what happens is we bring other partners to the table and find out that, you know, each one of us can contribute maybe a little bit to make something happen, or maybe it's the two partners that are able to work together and make something happen. So again, we just love to hear from your ideas on how, you know, the Forest Service and others, we can enhance that visitor experience increase access to our communities and recreation sites. So please reach out to us. Um, project proposal list in the coming years um, are planned to be developed collaboratively with input from partners and contractors and the public. And so it's never too late to start that process um, as we continue to move ahead and take care of our lands on the National Forest and our communities where we live and work and play. Thank you very much. We appreciate everything you had to share with us today, Hillary, and outlining the public-private partnership opportunities for our stakeholders to engage in. I'd like to now introduce to you Laurel Harkness, the Executive Director of the Society of Outdoor Recreation Professionals. Thanks for joining us, Laurel. Thank you, Mary. I'm so pleased to be joining the Wisconsin Office of Outdoor Recreation today as part of this mini webinar on the Great American Outdoors Act and Land and Water Conservation Fund. Through our work at the Society of Outdoor Recreation Professionals, we support all of the amazing people who manage outdoor recreation resources throughout the nation, as well as those who work in outdoor recreation planning and policy. I'm going to spend a few minutes diving into the Land and Water Conservation Fund. I'm hoping to stoke some excitement about the opportunity for Wisconsin and suggest a few actionable items for everyone to ensure that Wisconsin's able to best leverage the opportunities of LWCF. So LWCF, what is it? Why is it important? Uh, next slide. Um, it's not, LWCF is not new. It was established more than 50 years ago to assist states in planning, acquisition, and development of recreation resources. Uh, two recent laws, the John D. Dingle Conservation and Recreation Act of 2019, and of course, the Great American Outdoors Act of 2020 permanently reauthorized and fully funded LWCF at $900 million a year. And here's how it breaks down. So of that total LWCF funding at $900 million per year, a minimum of 40% goes to federal assistance and a minimum of 40% goes to state and local assistance. 
and 20% is administered at the discretion of the National Park Service under the Department of the Interior. So this is significant and permanent funding for outdoor recreation. So we are celebrating. Um, next slide. So we've got the historical LWCF appropriations here. So you can see from this that uh, this helps to illustrate the inconsistency of funding from year to year and how the funding levels have fallen short of full funding at $900 million. But even over this 50 year history of LWCF, there's been significant cumulative investment of LWCF funds in Wisconsin. Uh, one notable LWCF funded project, of course, is the Ice Age National Scenic Trail, where over $18 million of LWCF investment has come in over the last 15 years, matched by $22 million of Wisconsin Stewardship Fund. Uh, the list of, of LWCF funded acquisitions and projects in Wisconsin is extensive since the establishment of LWCF and there's probably something right in your local community. Uh, next slide. So um, awesome. OK, so Great American Outdoors Act has passed. There's full and permanent funding for LWCF. Um, what does that mean for Wisconsin and how much money are we talking about here? So um, for example, so in 2020, LWCF state allocation for Wisconsin was $3.9 million of $227 million, so 1.73%. So now at the new fully funded minimum levels uh, for LWCF, 40% of $900 million multiplied by that 1.73% translates into roughly $6.2 million for Wisconsin or a 57% increase in state and local assistance funding. And this is permanent. This is every year, something to look forward to. Um, next slide. So we the three pillars of the LWCF, uh, matching grants, creating a protected recreation estate, and outdoor recreation planning. So the matching grants. So with LWCF, there is a 50-50 minimum match requirement. So LWCF was created to amplify state and local investment in parks and recreation, not supplant it. Uh, LWCF creates a legacy of perpetual protection of grant assisted areas by prohibiting their conversion to non recreation uses. And the planning piece, when LWCF was established, Congress also required that planning be an essential part of a national effort to improve outdoor recreation opportunities thereby establishing the statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan as a prerequisite for funding. States are required to complete SCORPS every five years to be eligible to participate in the LWCF program. SCORPS are intended to evaluate outdoor recreation trends and issues of statewide importance and set forth ideas about recreation's future role in the state. There are several required elements for SCORPS, including identifying priorities for the use of LWCF grants. Of the many important issues related to outdoor recreation in Wisconsin, the SCORP highlights the areas of greatest need, thus providing a framework for evaluating LWCF grants. Uh, so next slide. So Wisconsin SCORP was um, uh, released, published in 2019, and it charts the plan for outdoor recreation in the state through 2023. And there's a few components. The next few slides are pulled directly from Wisconsin's SCORP. And I'm not going to go into all of the details, but I want to highlight a few sections within the SCORP and I encourage you to um, review it yourself. So next slide. So the state of Wisconsin's goals for outdoor recreation, and these are pulled, like I said, directly from the SCORP. So there's five. They're broad. Uh, there's a lot of projects that could slide right within all of these goals. So I encourage you to look within your local communities and find things that fit the goal. So the next slide. So the eligible applicants for LWCF state and local assistance. Um, it's restricted to towns, villages, cities, counties and tribal governments and school districts um, as well. But that is not to say that there can't be an army of partners who are integral to these projects behind these um, project sponsors that are very specific. Next slide. So the score highlights what is considered an eligible project. So it's very important. So these LWCF fundable projects must fall within this list of eligibility. It's very specific. Um, next slide. So Wisconsin in its SCORP has outlined 
a set of funding priorities, also very important. So Wisconsin will score prospective LWCF projects based on how well it addresses the funding priorities as set forth in the SCORP. So <laughs> we're whizzing through this. So next slide. Another important piece to get familiar with um, as referenced in the SCORP are the grant guidelines for the LWCF program. So I encourage you to get familiar with this. Uh, in particular, the long-term obligations for grant recipients, the reimbursement terms, sponsor match terms, and the scoring system. And the final slide here, these are a few things that you can work on now to leverage the LWCF funding opportunities. So establish those partnerships, work on that, encourage local investment in outdoor recreation to meet the match, get educated about the grant guidelines, and also get familiar with Wisconsin SCORP, uh, the planning process and the planning team. And that's a lot of information, and I'm, I'm happy to, to follow up with anybody that, that has any questions later. Thanks so much, Mary. Laurel, thank you so much for sharing those great details about the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the importance of partnership and how people can get engaged. We really appreciate your presentation today. I want to thank all of our presenters as we wrap up our mini webinar series. The Office of Outdoor Recreation is a resource to help you connect and we appreciate you tuning in today. Thank you so much.